right, folks, good evening. Welcome to another evening uh, of a United Parent Council evening event. Uh, we know there are a lot of events going on in the district tonight, so we are still live streaming this. We do have several people you can't see on the screen uh, on the camera tonight here, uh, but want to make sure that folks are able to see this on our Facebook uh, UPC site. If anyone is on uh, watching the live stream and wants to ask any questions, you can type those questions in. I will see those. Uh, we will do questions at the end. Uh, and we're doing it by note card this time, so I'm going to try and stay live for those questions and be able to continue the, the presentation with those questions. Uh, this evening, we'd like to introduce Dr. Dan Corson. Thank you for being here. Thanks, Melissa. Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for being here and for all of those online. We appreciate you tuning in uh, tonight as well. Uh, tonight, it's our pleasure to really present to you some information regarding uh, our K-8, for the most part, K-8 uh, science and uh, math adoptions, as well as the shifts in standards that have been happening within our state over the last uh, year and uh, to be implemented uh, as we move forward. And so uh, joining us tonight are two curriculum specialists from our district, Dr. Janice Mack, who will be presenting this evening on some of the shifts that we've had in our science standards and what the implications are for the kind of uh, teaching and learning that go on in our classrooms as a result of those standards. And also joining us is our curriculum specialist for mathematics in the district, Haven Miller. And she likewise will be talking about the standard shifts in mathematics and how that has led to the recent curriculum adoption across our K-8 system. So uh, thank you all and uh, Dr. Mack. Thank you, Dr. Corson. So thank you all for joining us tonight, both in person and um, online. But we, uh, I'll start off with starting uh, reviewing standards, curriculum, and instruction. So oftentimes these are used and sometimes confused with one another. So I'm gonna just start to talk a little bit about what standards are, what curriculum is, and what instruction is. So standards are defined by the state uh, and define what a student ought to know and be able to do by the end of uh, the grade level. They progress K through 12. They address a variety of cognitive demand levels. And again, they're adopted at the state. Curriculum, on the other hand, refer to those resources that are used for teaching and learning those standards. And those are adopted at a local or district level. And then the instruction refers to those methods that the teachers use in the classroom to support students to master those standards. So I'm gonna be addressing the science standards primarily. So we had a new set of science standards adopted in October 2018. But I'm gonna talk about it in terms of a journey and in terms of an analogy. So if you think about a car journey, we think about where we've come from, so that's kind of looking in the rear view mirror. Where we are now, that's kind of looking in the side mirror, so is it safe to switch lanes, right? <laughs> and then where are we headed is kind of looking through that windshield. So I'm gonna frame our discussion about those science standards using this analogy. So first of all, where have we come from? So it's really important to understand that we are building on the past so that we can really build on a strong future with these standards. And these standards are built on decades of research, starting from the 1990s, um, a lot of national associations were conducting research on what kids need to know in science K-12. That led to some further research in 2000, 2010s with books such as Ready, Set, Science, Taking Science to School, and really researchers were beginning to understand, wow, our kids really know a lot more than we give them credit for coming to school about science. And so researchers began to merge the what of learning science along with the how of learning science. And put together, that came out with a really important document in 2011, a framework for K-12 science education that really brought together those two things, the what and the how of learning science K-12. So our Arizona science standards are based on all this body of research. And it's based primarily on these two documents, a framework for K-12 science education, and then the later release of 2015, working with big ideas of science education. So that leads to where we are now. We are here to um, fulfill this vision that's outlined in these documents. So I'm gonna go through a series of slides and you can um, kind of think in your head along <laughs> what do you think there's less of and what do you think there's more of in these standards? So I'll kind of walk us through that. So less or more. Do you think there's less or more of rote memorization of facts and terminology in the new standards? Less, so there is less. And what do you think, less or more Facts and terminology learned as needed while developing explanations and designing solutions supported by evidence-based arguments and reasoning. 
more, right? So kids are still learning facts and terminology, but it's the, um, how we're asking them to do it. So not so much through rote memorization, but really through developing those explanations and designing solutions. So they really get a conceptual understanding, a deeper understanding of those facts and terminology. Less or more, teachers providing information to the whole class. Probably less, <laughs> and less or more, students conducting investigations, solving problems, and engaging in discussions with teacher guidance. More. More, so really these new standards are focused on the student and the student doing science, so learning science by doing science. Less or more, teachers posing questions with only one right answer. Less. less. And more of students discussing those open-ended questions that focus on the strength of evidence that's used to generate those claims. So this is a really, um, really focusing on, again, those student practices and those students doing science. Students reading textbooks and answering questions at the end of the chapter, less or more? Less, less. I'm seeing thumbs down. <laughs> okay, and more of students reading multiple sources, including science-related magazines, journal articles, web-based resources, students developing summaries and information. So again, really focusing on the students' critical thinking, they're reading across sources, they're able to summarize, analyze, obtain information, and communicate that information out in a variety of ways. Less or more worksheets? Less. Less. Okay. Yeah, and more of, <laughs> so students are still writing. <laughs> they're still writing to communicate and writing to learn, but they're writing hopefully journals, reports, posters, media presentations as examples that explain and argue again, communicating that information, that strength of evidence to communicate. So we're headed to fulfill this vision of really students applying the practices um, uh, learning experiences that engage students, engage their curiosity, their sense of wonder about the world, and then uh, really investigating how scientists practice science and do science and really bringing that to their classroom. They sh they'll have opportunities to engage in science investigations, engineering and design projects, um, all related to expanding their knowledge of those core ideas in science. So the engineering be the application of what they learn in science. So if we visualize that alignment, going back to those three important words, standards, curriculum, and instruction, we can think of like a laser. So the laser's light waves, they all travel together with their peaks that are lined up. And this is really important because that alignment creates that high focus and impact that lasers have. So in the same way with standards, curriculum, and instruction, we really want that alignment. That leads to, um, the, again, I'm gonna dive a little bit into this framework document. It really provided something what we call three-dimensional science instruction. And the three dimensions are core ideas, science and engineering practices, and cross-cutting concepts. So you can see that in the visual here. We have our core ideas, which is the physical life the science, life science, earth and space science. We have our cross-cutting concepts being the green, cause and effect, patterns, energy and matter, Things like that, things that cut across all domains of science. And then we have our practices on the outside. So things like asking questions and defining problems and so forth. So this is an example of a second grade standard. So obtaining, evaluate, and communicate information about ways heat energy can cause change in objects or material. So from this standard, if we unpack it and unwrap it, we can see that there is the practice of you know, obtaining, evaluating, and communicating information, and this is the students, again, doing that science. The cross-cutting concepts we can extract from there, it might be the cause and effect, right? Stability and change. So an engineering and design challenge might be something, um, you know, you have an ice cube, and the challenge is to think about the ice cube, how are we gonna keep it from melting, <laughs> for example, right? And in that, they're making observations, They're seeing, examining what causes change in that, and hitting on that core idea and some of that background information that heating can cause change, such as in cooking, melting solids, or changing water to vapor. So that three-dimensional learning, we're really focusing on the core ideas, which is again that what do we know, the how do we know and how do we find out, that is those science and engineering practices of asking questions, obtaining, communicating evaluation um, information, and then the why do we care, why do we know, the why part is those cross-cutting concepts that gives us that 
quest for why do we want to know all this. So those are the three dimensions all wrapped up into one um, as far as the uh, new science standards. So you can see um, the summary, the shifts, where we're headed. We really want to fulfill this vision of um, the new science standards. So I'm going to end with that and I'm going to pass it on to our master specialist. Uh, hello everyone, both online and here. Um, I thought I would start um, with a math question. So um, this is a, math, a current math question from our current curriculum. And um, I'm going to come back to it, but uh, take a moment to take a look at it. It's on the front of your page here. And if you'd like to, um, have a go at trying to answer this math. You don't have to do it right now, you can work on it. So in a similar way to science, we've had some instructional shifts in math, and um, this led us to adopt some new curriculum that supports these shifts and provides the foundation for our students to be successful in building that foundation to be successful in high school. So, as they move through and progress through, they're going to uh, build and build and build so that they'll have that understanding once they're into algebra. So just to remind everyone, because you might not be in middle school, that uh, we adopted Eureka Math, which is a, a, a K-5 curriculum for our um, K-5 students. And then we adopted as well Zern, also for our K-5. And for our 6-8, we adopted the problem-based curriculum of Open Up Resources, which was um, authored by Illustrated Math. Now, the thing about Zern is, is that we're, just, we're using the digital lesson component of Zern to reinforce the lessons that are being taught in the classroom by Eureka. So the teacher teaches the Eureka lesson, and then the student works on that same lesson in Zern. So they're getting the same lesson reinforced. So one of the first shifts that is focus. So what we're doing is focusing on fewer topics but going into greater depth. And I like to use an analogy as well. And I like to use the analogy that we are going scuba diving, not snorkeling. We're not doing a whole lot of topics anymore and just going right on the top, we're diving deeper into them. And this is so that we can support the major works of each grade level. So in K2, it's um, mostly addition and subtraction. 3-5, we're looking at multiplication and division and fractions. Uh, sixth grade, we're looking at ratios and uh, beginning equations and expressions. Seventh grade, we're continuing with ratios and proportional relationships, bringing in the rational numbers, and then moving in eighth grade towards our algebra and functions. So we're going deeper into these main topics. The uh, other sh instructional shift that we had in the standards is coherence. So this is thinking across the grades. Think the, it progresses all, not only linking to major topics, but also within the curriculum. So it's connecting the modules and units and the lessons to the major topics of the grade level. So you get that flow through all of them. And the third instructional shift is rigor. And uh, the Arizona State Standards use a balance approach to rigor. It's uh, a balance of conceptual understanding understanding the why of the math, application, the real world application of actually using math as well, and all that is also involved in uh, the procedural skills and fluency. And they break down fluency and procedural skills as being efficient, you know, moving towards the algorithm, being able to do it in, in the easiest, quickest way possible that's most uh, efficient, accurate that they're getting the right answers repeatedly, um, flexible that they're using different models and different approaches and different strategies to walk towards 
to work towards being efficient and appropriately picking that. So where it would be more appropriate to pick one strategy over another or more efficient. So you may pick an algorithm in one or you know, you're not going to, for example, once you're getting up there, you're not going to count like three digit numbers by counting on your fingers to use an extreme example. You're going to choose the most appropriate, flexible and efficient strategy. So procedural skills and fluency is not just being fast, it's also incorporating those other ideas as well. And that was a huge shift for the, um, the and helped us choose the curriculum that we did. Mathematics are effective teaching practices. So there's eight of them. And the first one is establishing math goals to focus learning. And on the back of your sheet, I've put a, a little chart on there that has the look for's for teachers and what it looks like in the classroom. And these are the sort of things that your, your children will be doing in the classroom. So it's not just having students just know what the topic of the lesson is, it's about them understanding the purpose of the lesson. So not just saying, if asked, not just saying, what are you doing today? I'm doing exponents. You know, understanding the, the concept behind what they're doing. So not just repeating what the lesson is called. And having various entry points and multiple ways to solve things. So you, all the ones at a different level and everyone has to feel, you know, have that growth mindset that they can come in and look at a task and have an entry point that they can move into. And this leads to another point, but here you also connect to promoting student discourse. And this is a very huge part of the curriculum that we adopted. There's a lot of peer-to-peer -peer discussion. We moved away from the teachers standing, doing exactly what I'm doing right now, standing here and talking to you, and more towards students working together to solve problems. Here's an example. This is the first lesson in um, grade eight. And this is called, which one doesn't belong? This is one of the strategies that we do, that we use. So take a moment and look at the four angles that we have here and decide which one doesn't belong in this picture. Is anyone brave? <laughs> Does anyone think that A doesn't belong? No? I think A, I think A, oh, okay. Why do you think A doesn't belong? It's the only one without an angle. Okay, yeah. I, I like that idea. It's the only one that's a straight line. If I didn't know anything about angles, I might say, well, this one's a straight line. That's a, a lower entry plane. Who thinks that um, B doesn't belong? Why do you think B doesn't belong? It's the only one that's a 90 degree angle. It, it is, it's a 90 degree angle. And so you could look at if they knew about a right angle or a 90 degree angle and have those discussions. Uh, who thinks that C doesn't belong? Okay, why do you think C doesn't belong? Uh, because it's an acute angle. Acute. There's that math terminology. And if you were having a, a child that was having a really low entry point, they might say, I think that C doesn't belong because it's the only one where not even using where the two lines are pointing down. Would they be correct? Mm -hmm. So would they feel confident? that they're having a discussion and saying that one doesn't belong. And this must be everybody else who didn't answer me. Uh, who thinks D doesn't belong? <laughs> it's the only of two angles. It's the only of two angles. Okay, so you can, the teachers are li listening here to hear, this is introduction, if they have the seventh grade and lower knowledge about angles. Do you know which one doesn't belong? All of them. They're all correct. It is there for a discussion to open up different possibilities. No one can be wrong. If you have somewhere where you can have a conversation, so right from this is the very first thing in the very first lesson, from that first second, they're being successful, the teacher's learning, getting some formative information on their background or prior knowledge, and everyone feels, wow, I did math and I did it good. This is um, what we love about it. Okay, 
Um, also, we talk about using and connecting mathematical representation. When people uh, have that conceptual understanding and the fluency in math, they can move from the concrete to the pictorial to the abstract fluidly, very easily. So to do that, uh, the curriculum that we have provides a variety of representations that do this. So if we were to look at the um, these five pictures here, I did not put them in order. So if we were to move from the concrete, a real thing, to a pictorial picture, to a more abstract concept, and this covers standards over kindergarten through sort of the beginning of third grade, different ways of representing that. So if I was to do that, then I'm looking at an actual thing, bundles. This is still pictorial, but the discs uh, have the numbers on them, so they have different colors and you can divide them up. Now we're looking at the same sort of thing, but onto a place value chart. Then we're looking at adding the place values on here. And then finally, and not, I mean, not finally in the whole picture of becoming more abstract, but using those number bonds and dividing them up. Here we have in the place value 200, four tens and three ones. So those representations and models move throughout the grades. And things like number lines, they first introduce number lines in kindergarten and they continue up into trigonometry. So it continues on and on throughout the grades and that's that also the coherence piece, that progression. Okay, so one of the huge changes is um, facil facilitating discourse. So this is a huge part of our curriculum and again, as I was saying, it's taking them from, you know, from the teacher giving direct instruction to being more of the guide on the side. So in our, we use a lot of more small groups and the teacher's there to facilitate that conversation. Now that doesn't mean we just send them loose and let them make up anything they want about math. That's not what we're doing. Um, the teacher is going around and making sure that the students understand the question, firstly. Like, what are we working towards? They're working individually and in groups sometimes when the student is listening, where the teacher's listening, and the teacher's asking questions to turn them back towards that point, right? So, and moving them forward. So if they're getting stuck, they're like, well, what about, what about what we did earlier? What can you remember from yesterday? What do you remember from last year? What in, you know, an, an, in the application problem that we did, do you remember that could help you with this problem? And then the students are working in groups. Again, the, the teacher is listening, seeing if she can hear any misconceptions, um, asking people how they, ha how they found their answer. Did anyone find it a different way? Could you show me a different way that you did it? What do you think about this model that this person used? And then the teacher is helping the students to synthesize that. So they're taking it and they're debriefing on it and talking about everything from what was the hardest part of what we worked on today to who did it different ways. And this is not the entire lesson, this is part of the lesson. There's problem sets and uh, application problems where they'll work on things together. There's still you know, places where they work on it together, but there's a lot more of this discussion, talking about that. Understanding other people's reasoning and being able to just talk with them about it as opposed to, turn to turning to the person sitting next to you and saying, what answer did you get? I got five, I did two, okay. So we're building on that discussion. And this is really good too, for, not for all our students, but especially for our EL students as well. Okay, another big point is supporting productive struggle. We're not, trying to um, frustrate students, but by having them work there without showing or telling them the procedure first, we're providing that entry point, helping to clarify, to synthesize, asking them about their thinking, and having it just that little bit above to challenge them. So we're not 
throwing people out there and saying, oh, well, just keep going and getting things wrong. But we're teaching them that sometimes it's okay to start something, get it wrong, stop, think about it, and think about a different way of going about it. Because in real life, that's how we solve problems. We don't go, we don't go in our job, okay, I have to do this. Oh, no, that's not right. Okay, I give up. That's not where we go. That's not what happens in college. That's not what happens in the workforce. So having that productive struggle is huge so that they develop that perseverance and grit. And we, it uses a lot of um, formative assessment. So where teachers use the exit tickets or the cool downs in middle school to determine the next step. So they take, give them every day, they're taking them and using them to guide the instruction for the next step. So it's not just, okay, we move on to the next page or the next topic, it's taking what the students have done and saying, did they understand that and what's my next move? And again, we don't want to make our productive struggle frustrating. So students are encouraged to uh, do these sort of ideas to when they're given problems and uh, where they have enough mathematical knowledge to approach the problem. It's very, it goes in very small increments. So we're building, we're building not only across grade levels, but in lessons and topics and just giving them enough of that knowledge to do the next thing. To give them permission to try, to have that growth mindset, to, to pursue ideas and, and be okay about it if it doesn't work. Let's try something different. What did you do? Let's incorporate that in a group. To share ideas that might be wrong and right. Well, what do you think about that? Looking at errors, and I, I always refer to it as my favorite no, so having an error and I'm picking this one out and I'm like, how could we, you know, how could we take this and how could we make it right? Like here's some good points in it, what, what could we do differently? So analyzing the errors is also a really good part of the curriculum. And listening to peers' ideas and comparing your ideas to others. These are skills that transcend math. They can be used in a whole lot of other areas. And a whole lot of it is about posing pur purposeful questions. So teachers questioning students, it reveals their understanding. So, but they're very intentional about the questions. The questions are there to work out what it is they know and where we need to go next. So they can clarify their thinking. They're trying to debrief and synthesize what the students are learning. Going back to that really important shift in the standards under rigor, we're talking about building procedural fluency from conceptual understanding. So this is where we allow students to choose from a variety of methods. We, we teach them a variety of methods, but we are asking them to explain why it works and not rely on tricks, like why do we keep change flip? That's what we learned at school. You know, what, what's the reason behind it? but to move towards efficient procedures. And our efficient procedure, most likely eventually, is gonna be the algorithm. That is the most efficient. We, they still teach that, they just build towards it. And sometimes that is the most efficient, and, and sometimes it's not. I, I don't know about you, but I don't do a lot of long division in the grocery store, <laughs> you know, or multiplication. You know, I'm doing stuff in my head and using what I know conceptually about numbers and math, and I'm sure all of you are too. Not many of us are, you know, wait a second, I'll just work out. Here, for example, if you were to add in your head 998 and 337, do you know what the answer is? 1,035. 1,335. How did you do that? By adding 1,000 to 337 and subtracting 2. So you added 2 to make this 1,000, yeah. and you took away the 2 to add that. And that's exactly what we teach them. So we move up starting from number bonds 
and moving along to get so that they can fluently do that in the head the same way that we do all the time. So can you do the algorithm? Yeah, I can put 998 and you know, add 8 and 7 and carry the 10 and do all that. But if I teach them to break apart those numbers, then that's where that efficiency and fluency comes in. Here's another one. Which is greater, and I won't make you do this one, which one is greater, a third or a fourth? A lot of people will think a fourth because a fourth sounds bigger. And we teach, we in the past, we've taught kids to find the common denominator. First we teach them to find the common denominator, then we teach them to multiply, and then we teach them to compare fractions. But when we think of conceptual understanding, we start with a model. We draw it. If you draw a diagram and divide it in thirds and divide it in fourths, a very young student can visually see this and get that and start to understand fractions and become fluent with them. So what really I'm saying is that we're trying to provide tools for their toolbox. So we often have the algorithm and it's a very efficient tool to use. But if we give them a whole lot of tools in their toolbox, then they can choose the model that's most efficient, which could be any of the different strategies. As long as they know them, then they can choose the most efficient strategy. So back to Zoe. Did anyone work out how many stamps Zoe had? Very good. That is correct. So I I plugged so it in. I plugged it. I'm not surprised. So I plugged it into um, one of those algebra calculations and gave it to the high school IDLs. So this is the um, traditional math with every step. I'll admit. Okay. So there's a few steps that you would probably know in your head because you're fluent. But if I told you that this is actually a fifth grade strategy, a fifth grade problem, and you're gonna say, well, I know that our fifth grade students can't, aren't gonna be able to do this. But what they can do is this. So we gave two fifths of the stamps to Lionel. So we know there's fifths, we know there's five parts in a fifth, and she gave two of them to Lionel. She used one third of the remaining stamps to mail thank you notes. She had 14 stamps left in those last two. So if she had 14 stamps in the two, then how many is in one fifth? Seven. And then how many is in the whole? 35. 35 stamps. And this is working from divide, you know, starting with tape diagrams and working from kindergarten, moving up to the model. So yes, sometimes the algorithm, but sometimes the more, most efficient way. Okay, resources. So um, we, I have developed, or the person before we started then developed a, um, a website that is inside the district's intranet for teachers to have all the resources that they need. And that's great, except if you're a parent and not a teacher and you can't access that. So, firstly, Marisha from VIPs, she, she came to me and she said, Kat, no one can see all the stuff that's here. The parents need stuff and the VIPs need stuff. So I created another website. And also, if you don't have it already, and neither do I. There's another sheet for the homework helpers, and the homework helpers are uh, go with every homework piece. So for every homework lesson, there's a homework help. Uh, on that sheet is if you don't have it already or don't have access to it, there is a code on there for you to access it, and you the code gives you access from kindergarten all the way through. So when you are helping with homework then uh, you have this hope. Now they're not exactly the answer, they're there to explain what they're doing. Okay, so they're helpers. So you can have that sheet while your child is doing the homework. Um, 
vocabulary that's used throughout Eureka so that if you come across a word that you don't know like a tape diagram or a number bond this will explain and show you what it looks like so, so they have different different models I've also um, put on here the roadmap that they put at which shows you um, how the progression goes through, what your child will be learning throughout each year. You just click on your grade level. I've also um, included the standards alignment between Eureka and the Arizona standards. They were one of, uh, they were one of the highest rated in the non-profit non ed reports for being aligned to the standards. And I've included the standards progressions for you. So you can go in and click on this and see where each student is going, where each standard is going and where it's come from. That, that, that. There you go. So each one has it on there. And then I also include, I have more pictures. <laughs> so another one that shows you the models and shows you the progression of the key standards through the grades. So you can connect them and take them. So then I uh, also in, put on here um, the parent tips, uh, parent handbook, which goes through each one. I did uh, topic tips from that Eureka put out for each um, topic. So each, you know, they divide in topics like three to five lessons. And in that, it will give you a sample problem, talk about what you should be seeing, how you can help, some of the terms and explain some of the models that they use. If you're a person that prefers to hear, I've also included uh, videos that explain the different models. And as I come across more, I'm continuing to build this website. And I also included, because it is a open education resource and freely available, I've included the uh, teacher's edition so you can see what's being taught the questions that are being asked and the homework, just in case one gets lost, because we know sometimes they do. And uh, so I put them on there. So you can access this at any time. If there's something else that you want, let me know. I mean, I keep building it all the time and I will put it, put it on there. And I do that. I also down the bottom included um, some fluency games and Eureka card games that can help build that fluency just for practice, just for fun. And um, also you'll find in there different places where it gives you ideas of things to do at home. So this website is just to support parents. Um, and like I said, I'm here to support you and to help your child to be successful. So if there is something else you want, please let me know and I will find it. For, and if I can't find it, I will make it. And we'll, we'll get it on there for you so that you have those resources. That's great. And uh, that's it. Okay, we are going to stay live, which we don't normally do. Um, I do have a couple of questions. Dr. Mack, if you want to go up so I can have the two of you up there for some of the questions, um, I'll just pull this back a little. Folks here, if you want to submit some questions to me, I do have questions from folks online. I'll be happy to... Um... Okay, you, you got to get a little close to each other. <laughs> there you go. Okay. <laughs> that's fine. You got another one? Okay. There you go. So, so I do, and normally we don't, we don't stay live for the questions, but because we've got folks from online asking them, we gave them the opportunity. That's kind of nice. Um, the first question I have is, uh, what resources do teachers have to help them debrief and ask the students those intentional questions? And there's a follow-up from that, but I'll start with that. Uh, I, it, 
didn't specifically say, but let's say yes. Let's start with math. Okay, so that in the teacher guide, and you, you can go in and look at the teacher guides, they're all there. It has the list of questions that are suggested. It's not meant to be a script. They're just suggestions. And teachers should use their uh, formative assessment, their exit tickets, to decide what questions they ask, depending on the student's needs. But it does go through and, and provide what they call a vignette. It's not a script. It's like, imagine having a, an expert teacher in the next room and listening to her, and this is what, what they'd say. And they also have access to over 2,000 professional development um, videos that we have the digital suite for Eureka, which are provided by the writers. So they go through the different ways to use things, the different ways to use models, and um, that's been provided to the teachers as well, as well as other professional development opportunities. I, and that actually goes right into the next question. Is I must have read the card. What? <laughs> You were reading my phone. What <laughs> ongoing training are they getting to teach in the way you are demonstrating? Are they learning that process? Because obviously that is what's so different with the math. Correct. So besides meeting in their PLCs, uh, we did provide uh, professional development uh, earlier in the year and also over summer to introduce it. And we also do have that professional development suite. I, I also go out and meet individually with teachers. I spend a day in every school, rotating through the schools, where they come and talk to me on their prep and during lunch, and uh, to discuss um, any questions that they have. So they have that online professional development all the time available. So that's like that just-in-time professional development. And starting again um, on the 11th, so in a couple of days, we're also doing a professional development for each grade level, which is going over doing those really deep connections between the uh, standards and um, the questions in Eureka. So taking those questions and saying, let's look at the lesson. What are the questions that um, really show what a student looks like when they are proficient or highly proficient? Or where do we need to build that ladder? So we're doing a professional development individualized to each grade level as well. And that's, um, and that's um, coming up, it'll continue on, starting in a couple of days. Okay, uh, the next question is ninth grade math does not use Eureka. Are there any anticipated issues with the transition from eighth to ninth grade math? Well, we're actually looking to at the standards. We looked at our um, where the problems with ninth grade, and it's not something that's just our district. This is a, a, a nationwide um, occurrence. And we looked at those essential standards and the way we've been teaching them in sixth, seventh, and eighth grade and identified the most important ones uh, for ninth grade. And this is our first step. So. We developed um, over summer a diagnostic test. So over the most essential that the, t the high school teachers identified as the most essential for success in algebra one, two. And the first two weeks of school, uh, the first day they do that test and then they're re going over that. But we are coming up for an adoption as well for high school, that's our next one and we'll definitely be looking at continuing that progression and continuing that way. You're, if you're going to adopt a new program at the high school level, will, will there be parents involved in the adoption? Because, because I, I... You want to be there? If you're <laughs> going to change the math program, I'm my 10th grader, yes. <laughs> yes, I would very much like to commit just The it. community is <laughs> always involved with uh, yeah. community members, yeah. teachers, parents, so, okay. a whole lot of different people, and it's something that goes over. Okay. That's okay. Let me qu qu clarify that. Just so you know, United Parent Council has sat on all okay. of these adoption committees. Okay. We've had parents on all of the last awesome. five of there. There has not been one in PV. I've been involved in the district for 10 years, and we've had parents involved in all of those, and we struggle to find people that are interested. So please let us knew, know because we, we are always looking for parents we'll wanting to participate. Yes. So that, that is a challenge. Any other questions that people have written down that you want to pass on? No? Um, well, I have a question. 
the program, the math um, tools that you developed uh -huh. yourself, those are available on the school district website? I didn't, I mean, mostly, I don't develop them myself. What I do is collect research-based um, that's being used along with the program. So I'm taking stuff from ADE, I'm taking stuff from, that's you know, research-based strategies. Okay. I'm taking all the resources for the curriculum and putting them all together. Okay. But yes, I put them all on there. If there is something on there that you want, that you didn't see on there, let me know and I will put it, it's fully transparent. Okay, so I have that all the teaching guides and everything. This that you gave us here for Eureka is a separate entity. Yes, that's, um, that's, a, that's a, on a license system, so right. I can't public. I do have examples, they freely give out the first three modules, but we, that's something that's paid for, so they don't, you can't, I'm not allowed to put it on a public facing right. website, so we give out a code and then, but it's very simple, you just sign up and then you just go to your grade level, click on the lesson and it'll come up. You can't print them though, <laughs> because they're protected, so right. I can't print them and give them right. to you. But this website on the bottom of this page is the resources. Yes, it is. And I, I know some of our gifted classroom teachers were really struggling because for those that don't know, our self-contained programs are generally a couple of grade levels above. So with this rollout, they were having, it's, it appeared they were having to jump through not only trying to learn the lessons, but teach double time in essence to try and push them forward and make sure that they were going over stuff that they wouldn't have gotten because they're having to jump to grade levels. Has that settled down a little bit? It has. I just had a meeting last week, I think, with the, I mean, with um, the gifted uh, specialists. I talk um, on Monday, I'm meeting again with Elizabeth. Um, she has some ideas, so we're constantly in contact. Um, we take our data from our AZ, um, from our mimics, and individually the teachers can look at it and look at any standards that, um, that they may have gaps in because sometimes they've skipped and then address them. We use a, a, pro, a platform that has artificial intelligence called uh, Teacher Advisor, which you put in and it easily shows them the prerequisites. So we have the uh, standards. Remember how I talked about those progressions, the things that they built on, so they can go back and look at where those gaps were and fill them. So, That's so great. Because that does happen sometimes when, you, when you, they're starting at a different level here, they may have a little gap that you didn't know about until you tested them. Right. Do we have other questions here? We have some questions for our science? Yeah, somebody, somebody <laughs> asked Jenna something. <laughs> well, a, couple, I, a couple of, one thing I heard a rumor, so I wanted to validate if this is true or not. I'd heard at the ninth grade level that they're thinking about not doing physics in ninth grade. Is that accurate? <laughs> so um, I would say at this point um, it is a rumor. <laughs> we are um, we are having conversations just about um, because of the new standards and the timeline. It has implications for um, high school pathways, and that is a conversation that's happened throughout the state in neighbor in districts all over the state. So that um, because um, what it, it what it is is by eleventh grade students high school students will have to have covered all the high school essential standards across earth science, life science, and physical science, physical science, including some chemistry concepts. So um, I would say it's something that we are just having discussions about. Nothing definite um, has been decided at all. So um, that's where we are now, early, early discussion. And really, we're all about focusing on the students, focusing on their success, and what's really going to help them um, be successful. So um, that is our <coughs> conversation. That's what we're focusing right now. One other thing on the, just in general, um, and I don't know how strict this is, but I was under, was under the impression that for like the high school level, if you're gonna take honors math, you're taking honors science, and not one versus the other. Um, and I guess I just am wondering about that, because I, I, I find, I know at least with my son, and you know, even my own personal experience, can be really strong in math, and not necessarily in science, but I feel like right now I was forced to kind of hold him back in math, so he's kind of bored in math, just because I didn't want to put him in the honors science. So I just not really sure that 
I understand the necess you know, the need for the correlation in that. So just feedback. Um, Do Dr. Corson, do you want to? I mean, do you want to comment on that? I mean, as a, I can say as a parent with a child in a the Crest program, that is an element of the Crest program. But for students that are not in the Crest program, my knowledge is that they can take whatever classes they want. No, it's an all or nothing in yeah, my school as well, and it's yeah, not. I was told it yeah. was. Yeah, it's all honors or nothing. And same thing, you know, he's, he's, he's 100 percent in math, and, and it's boring for him. And yet, science is what he's still. But they're different. They aren't necessarily. I can understand if you're not necessarily good in math that you don't want to put him in. You know, like this, that's the stronger need, you know, to be successful in science. But I think you can be very successful in math and not necessarily be the top science student. So just see that. Um, yeah, and, and, and you're right about that. It's not it's not been designed at a, from a district level that those two courses go hand in hand necessarily. There are probably some students that would benefit from each being in the honors, but but yeah. certainly there are individual pathways and they're intended to to be a parent, student, counselor, teacher decision regarding what's going to be most appropriate. Well, what could be happening, and you could check with the counselor on this, depending on the school, it may end up how they align the classes mm -hmm. so that if you happen to be taking an honors class, a math class would then align with another period that would be an honors right. science class, okay. vice versa, to be able to utilize the rooms and have the teachers available, they, they may be alternating because of that. Um, I mean, I know that's part of the reason, certainly in the Crest program, you, you don't have an option because you wouldn't be able to fit them in. No, schedule. There's, there's scheduling-wise, there's no way. So that could be the case. Um, and one other thing on in math, I've always wondered this because, and I don't know if you guys see this or not, but I've always felt like math in general is very logical, analytical, left brain, except for geometry. Geometry is completely spatial, different. So I just find that some students can excel in every other type of math except for geometry, or vice versa, kids that maybe aren't as good as the other can do well. So I just wondered if there was, because I, I was worried about where if they're taking honors normally and they normally excel you know, mm -hmm. in math, that they tend to maybe want to put them in an honors geometry, which that could be detrimental for them because it's such a different, I mean, I just find those two totally different. Kaylin Janice, do you have a thought on that? <laughs> Well, I, I, I don't know, I have a parent as well, <laughs> and so um, I see that with my own children as well. Um, so yeah, I think it's something definitely to consider. Um, I think it's just good input, and I think we can. And yeah, I, mean, I, don't I know, think calculus is like a different thing too. Test yeah, like a, yeah, you know, you need yeah. to kind of test their spatial yeah. Yeah. thinking before yeah. they go put them in it. Yeah, honors. I don't know, just some feedback. Yeah, that's some, definitely that's something. Just yeah, good, good feedback. Point. Yeah, definitely good feedback. Go ahead. Yeah, and I do have another one that came okay. in online. But go ahead. Uh, back to math, K eight uh, math. Uh, what, if any, is the role of Khan and that resource mm -hmm. in the math curriculum mm -hmm. in K eight? Okay, so our, our adopted curriculum in K eight is the ones that I said: Eureka, Zern, and um, um, and Open Up or Illustrative Math. Khan is a good support, and um, it has its place. I know some of the gifted classes definitely use it but uh, that's exactly what it is it's a support it's not what the governing board not what we it's not the one that we adopted it's not our adopted curriculum but a lot of parents you know sometimes do it at home or as an extension sometimes in um, and sometimes in gifted so they do have a pathway that's aligned to both Eureka and um, open up illustrative um, so they do follow the same they have a pathway that follows that same thing but it is a support and that's the follow-up. Is there a connection between uh, the Eureka and the Zern, like lesson over here equal lesson over here, or yes. some, there is? It's an exact, it's an exact, so it, the digital lesson, there isn't a digital lesson for every Eureka lesson. Some of them don't lend themselves right. for that. Right. And we adopted just the digital portion, portion. So the lessons that do have that, it is literally the, the same lesson, but given to you by a different person on the computer. We all know that sometimes one person will tell you something, explain something, and you're like, I don't get it. And, but someone else can explain it, and you do. So it's, it, it, it's a beautiful marriage in that way that 
they do that le that exact lesson and then it gets reinforced again you know but using those but also those fluency games and the different things exactly the same so yes they're exactly alike okay, it uses the they use the because um eureka is an open educational uh, resource they used it's free for other people to check reuse so they use the exact curriculum okay thank you okay I, oh. sorry no go ahead more. I would ask about science, but this is a first grade table, and like, science is just fun, right, right now. So. Uh, math is fun, too, but I may look 16, but I'm much older, so my way is old school, and in talking about it with all the other parents and stuff, uh, what seems to be troublesome for myself and my kids and maybe some other folks that I've spoken with um, is the fact that um, they're being taught something at school they come home with the homework that they have to do by Thursday and they can't really explain to us how it needs to be done and they don't necessarily remember the vocabulary that the teacher is trying to use, or it's like a word problem, and they're still, they still might be struggling readers, and you know, so there's like, how, do, how can it be fine-tuned so that this struggling that you're talking about, this struggling that- Productive struggling. Productive struggling actually is productive because in talking with other parents it can feel as if we're getting irritable in trying to help them succeed because we're not quite understanding the new methodology or what's happening in class originally homework sheets were sent home for the parents that's not happening you've given us tools here now so that's fantastic um, but it just like the, it's not translating. Whatever's happening in class, oh, yeah. is, it's hard to see at home. So when they want to do homework, but they're staring at the sheet, and we don't know what's being asked, it's it's a it's just it's not productive. Productive, yeah. It's and not working out. And actually, this is one of the questions from the online person was, I guess originally homework. Um, was coming home and uh, had an example of how to do the problem. Now what is coming home does no longer has an example. Right. But then you just gave us that resource. Which Correct. Is resource which is excellent. But it, for some of us that I, myself included, it, it almost feels like we also need to relearn this style because sure. You know, I'm in my 40s, I learned the old school way. You're gonna have me do 936 plus 375. I'm gonna do it just like that. When I did not even think about rounding up to a thousand, I mean, that's nowhere in my, my brain. So, and I think it's a fantastic idea because it makes everything easier. Yes, I see where you're going with it, but if I'm not getting it, I'm gonna get frustrated. And then that puts frustration on my kids who we want them to have productive struggle, to mm -hmm. feel confident and successful. Yeah, no, no, that's, I, except I can't believe that you don't remember your math from first grade, that's the only thing. <laughs> <laughs> no, I have a couple, I just, like I said, they, we've had, you know, those homework help fairs. Right. So I was, if you didn't, didn't have them, I'm, I'm glad that you have them now. Um, I have the videos on there as well. Um, right. I did provide, you also have the teacher's guide, so you can literally go in and yeah. see what the teacher's, which has the answers to the homework problems in it. All the problems are worked, not just answers, work problems in there. Okay. Um, also another really great way to do it is to go into their Zern account. You can re-watch any lesson that they've already done and watch, it's only like 10 minutes, watch that teacher explain okay. it. That is the, like the best way. You could sit there, they love Zoom. You know, they could do the little fluency right, games and it. then you could watch the teacher and do the, the student 
the student work together. And I also have on there the Zoom student notes. So even if you wanted to use the notes and fill it in, you could do that as well. So that would be my suggestion. Yeah, that's great. I'm glad that people will use the can, website. Can you yeah. give us the www for the website? Because that was not on anything I have here. Are it's you? It's on the bottom of um, this sheet here. Oh, I see. And it, and it, okay. It will be, we're working on oh. getting it linked to the curriculum. It will also be linked to the curriculum web page on, uh, on the um, TV school. School's website as well, but it's sort of on. I, I've got it. I, I posted it. I've got it there. And if you can't, it's on the. Also, if you can't find it, just email me at K A Y Miller, and when I respond to you, it's on the bottom of my email, and you can just click the link. We'll we'll add it to the UPC okay. website I'm sorry, as well. I interrupted someone. Oh, I just have a question. Um, Is it for science? No. Oh. <laughs> well, it could be for both, but okay. uh, I'm also a first grade parent, so and a kindergarten parent. Okay. But anyways, um, I'm wondering how frequently you look at the curriculum of adoption, how many years until you look at potentially a new adoption. I'm just curious. Let's review. Now. How frequently is the curriculum change. adoption change. possibly changed? I, it's um, you know, oftentimes when we contract with vendors mm -hmm. for more traditional curriculum adoptions, that tends to be either six or seven years is when we typically go on contract with a particular vendor. But there are other things that happen in between that sometimes cause us to look at other additional either curriculum resources or supplemental resources. When we have changes in standards, for example, that becomes a time when we look at our curriculum resources and determine whether or not we have to make a change. Or when um, uh, st student data is indicating to us that we're finding that we've got some significant gaps with what students are learning, we sometimes then go to the curriculum resource to determine is it a problem that our curriculum resource is not uh, a, a achieving the success we want or is it another type of problem. If it's a curriculum resource problem, then we have to make decisions about whether or not we look at supplementing that with additional resources or whether we want to change that resource. So there's no, like every three years, we automatically go through a cycle. We definitely do every six to seven years when we're working with a particular vendor resource, but we're always looking at curriculum resources every year. It, does that make sense? Okay. And, and from United Parent Council, I will tell you that um, it, they don't do them all at one time, so they are staggered. And I think in the, since I've been involved just the last, gosh, three years, we've done math, we've done science, we've done social studies. World language. World language. So, I mean, it, it's, I'd say almost each year, every other year, something is being addressed because they're done separately, either K-5, K-8, and 912, there you don't usually have a vendor that's covering all of them, so there is some split between that, and it is a long process. And as they mentioned before, um, the, all the stakeholders are involved um, when new curriculum is being developed. I mean, there the parents are involved on that. It goes back to the schools. All parents are being given the opportunity. They just usually don't see the emails that say, please come look at it. We've got this opportunity. You can come look. I mean, it's, it's always made available before they make that decision. And it, if you're involved on the panel, it's usually over a six-month period. Is that it's about right, Dr. That's Corson? about six months. Yeah. And, and, and what I will say with the uh, adoption of uh, Eureka, Zern, and illustrative math, that actually spanned about a year and a half. Mm -hmm. uh, before we even adopted it, we piloted it in classrooms across the district. Uh, we collected feedback from both teachers, students, uh, and parents of those uh, pilot classes before we even committed uh, to doing it. So that one actually took us about a year and a half to come to an agreement that that was the curriculum that we wanted to adopt. I do have several additional questions here, so I'm gonna try and, I can't really consolidate them. They're a little, they're, some of them are unique. Um, has anyone given Eureka Zern feedback on the tickets 
or test out and practice on the half pages that the type is so small? Yes. Okay. Okay. So the exit ticket. So remember I was talking about the formative assessment that drives the instruction. So at the end of each lesson, there is this thing called an exit ticket, which has one or two, or sometimes three questions on where the students demonstrate their understanding. And then the teachers take those questions and use that um, to decide where they go the next day. Like, do they need, you know, a question, an extra scaffold, or do they already get this and we can move on? So um, we, this was our first year printing. We're, we're, we're self-printing. And um, so we developed it and we put the exit tickets because there's something that is just, the information is taken and usually um, then it's just, that's it. You get rid of them. Once you've got the data, the teacher has got, they don't need to keep them. So, but <laughs> what we found, especially with our, like our uh, first through say third grade, is that it was really small for the for the students and it's just something we you know it was a it was a, something we were learning as we went along we'd never self printed before so i've been making up the files for next year's printing and um i've already we're about halfway through and um all the exit tickets for k5 will now be on a full sheet of paper thank you um, Sorry. <laughs> here's an interesting one. We haven't talked about this, Dr. Corson. You might have an answer as well. Are any other schools in the country using Eureka in Spanish that we can work with? Well, uh, um, we, uh, Caitlin, you probably have a better answer. I, I've got a couple of thoughts, but you want to um, I, In the country? I, I've reached out to Eureka just to ask because um, we do have you know, a school, and um, I know that there are districts in um, Utah, and especially in different states. We haven't reached out to them yet. You know, we're just very early in our adoption, um, but I don't personally know anybody. So just, just to explain for those here that are not familiar, especially because we have first grade parents, we do have both Mandarin and Spanish being taught in an immersion program and often in the early grades, math is one of the uh, classes that is taught in the immersion program. So either in Spanish or in Mandarin. Uh, so this, right. so um, that's a great question. And, and Caitlin has been working specifically with both of our campuses that have immersion programs uh, right. through that. And, and there have been some challenges right. uh, in, in teaching, uh, as there are in teaching any, content in a different language. And um, so we've been working with, the, uh, with those two schools through that program. Uh, another question is, if assessments are done on computers, how do parents see these results? The Eureka and, do, do, I'm not sure what they mean. If they're doing, talking about the, the Eureka or the Open Up, they're a paper-based assessment at this time. No. I'm sure I'll get an answer here in just a second. <laughs> okay. Um, let's see. I don't. I don't know if they're in. Um, the resources you're mentioning are on those websites that we just talked about. I will type that in here, but I can't type that long of a thing as I'm trying to do all these other things. I will type it in at the end of this and make sure that website is there. Um, but you have both the Eureka Math and then you have this uh, Google site for... That's, that's on our dist that's the, the district website. Yeah. So that's a, I created a public-facing website outside of the internet. So it's one that anyone, that any of the parents can access. But the Eureka one, you'll need the code to access the homework helpers because they're on a license. My stuff is free. Um, will the students have access to Zern over the summer between grades? Yes, um, Zern, Zern is um, a free, probably is a free portion of it. Um, you can, I've also even heard of um, um, people even starting their own Zern account at home to do a different, you know, different remediation or stuff they want to work on but you, having a separate account, you cannot go open your own account. All you do is just 
plug it in and, and open it, anyone can access it, and it's available all year round. On math still. So sorry. We're oh, sorry. I'm oh, sorry. Just before one last thing. You wouldn't be able to, unless you created your own one, you wouldn't be able to move ahead. That you'd be able to go back and review so that they wouldn't forget anything over summer, say, that they'd already done. But um, if you, so because they I wouldn't necessarily recommend that they moved ahead because they're reinforcements of the Eureka lesson. So I would stay within stuff they'd already done. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to. And I actually do have one for you. So I'll go you first because you haven't talked in a long oh. time. Um, <laughs> with, uh, with high school science, um, if it gets realigned and there isn't physics anymore, the kids that are currently in high school or starting in the next year, are they going to end up repeating a, a, a science class again? Or will no, we no. make sure that it's not no. getting no. doubled up? Yeah. We would make sure. Okay. So even if it gets realigned, whatever they did, the kids that are in that cusp year will get dealt with. Okay. This goes into rumor land again. In rumor land, um, the self-contained classes in elementary school are not doing ZERN. They, they're not participating in that because of the high degree of repetition in the, in the ZERN program. Is, is, if that is true, then when you gave the resources for us to look at ZERN as a way of working, what, what would we do instead if we don't have ZERN as an option? Well, you could, like I said, it's a free account, so you could start your own ZERN account and be able to use it. I mean, I, I mean, when I'm going, I don't know about this rumor, but, oh, okay. you know, when I'm going to, I mean, I've seen the figures for in the thousands and thousands from ZERN on, on our participation rates. They're extremely high. They actually contacted us because we're just using, we're using their free component and they're like, you have thousands and, you know, thousands and thousands of students using it. Um, the students really like using it, so I've not heard that people are not using it because, um, okay. And the data that I've got from ZERN um, suggests that people are using it. But if, well, if I'm, for some I'm sure the vast majority of classes if are some but self contained as its own little special unit. Self contained gifted? Self contained gifted classes because of the high degree of repetition okay. in the ZERN program. Okay. So higher. if you had a student that was, I see what you mean, so if you're saying that they didn't need the reinforcement? That the ZERN program itself is so highly repetitive that it is detrimental to those students that don't respond well to high repetition programs. So that would be a conversation, I haven't heard of it, would okay. be a conversation you know, with the teacher, I would think, um, and a decision based on what would be best for the student. Okay. But maybe you could, um, if you wanted something that was digital, that might be a really good place where Khan would be a good support. Okay. And it, it is repetitive because it literally is reinforcement of yeah. exactly the same lesson. So if that's not something that, that helps a child to be successful, then have a chat with, with your teacher and look at other options that would suit that individual child. Okay. So maybe, yeah, with that mind, I don't, I'm not sure. I just wanted to clarify on the science. We weren't removing physics from high schools. The, the rumor was just ninth grade, was that correct? I don't know what the rumor is, but yeah. <laughs> I guess it were at the very, very early stages. Yeah, the rumor I think that, that, was, sh that was shared was, yeah, ninth grade. Yeah, it's know, just resequencing it. It's just resequencing it. Yeah. It's okay. just resequencing yeah. it because yeah. you wouldn't remove it from high school. Oh, no, it's yeah. just the, no. when you yeah. gave the examples of what was yeah. not being resequenced, physics was not listed in those examples, but okay, I get it. Right. Well, and incidentally, physics is not the ninth grade curriculum at every, every high school. High school. Right. Every high school has a different pathway, and so a couple of our schools does have predominantly physics as their ninth grade classes, but at maybe, I would say, three of our high schools, mm -hmm. it is not mm -hmm. uh, the, the entry level class. So each of our high schools currently has a different pathway. Mm -hmm. What we are working towards is seeing if we can actually create a common pathway uh, you know, for our district, but we have just started just those conversations. Started, yeah. Anything that we, um, do though will not impact next year. If we're looking at uh, creating a more common pathway for all of our high schools, we're looking for a potential implementation year of the year after uh, next, and we have mm -hmm. not even decided yeah. what that pathway would be. 
Any other questions? Thank you all for staying and, and asking. Thank our online audience for asking those questions. I'm going to shut the video down.